Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and welcome back to part 2 of our Guandu Let's Talk Lore series, titled On the Eve. Now, in our last episode, we ended with Yuan Shao formally declaring war against Cao Cao, as he aimed to muster up a force of 100,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry to march south. But mustering up such a force takes time, and making matters worse, there were already disagreements within Yuan Shao's own circle of advisors regarding their approach for the coming campaign. At this time, Yuan Shao's chief military advisor was Ju Shou, who had been an advisor under Han Fu prior to Han Fu's abdication to Yuan Shao. And since then, Yuan Shao had entrusted most of his military matters to Ju Shou, who did not disappoint. But on the eve of battle, Ju Shou presented a battle plan that many within Yuan Shao's court disagreed with. Now, according to Ju Shou's plan, Yuan Shao should first send an envoy south using the guise of presenting tribute and loot acquired from putting down the rebel Gong Sun Zan to try to meet the emperor. And given Cao Cao's paranoid tendencies, there is a good chance that Cao Cao will refuse to give audience to our envoy. Then we can seize on this opportunity and proclaim that Cao Cao had cut off the emperor from the matters of state and use it as a rallying cry to start our war with Cao Cao. Now this step is important because having the proper Kaza belly can win over allies, as Cao Cao was surrounded by a lot of potential enemies from Ma Teng and Han Sui out west, Zhang Xiu in Nanyang, Liu Biao in Xiangyang, Liu Xuan in Lujiang, Liu Bei in the Yu province, and Sun Ce in the south. But aside from securing this proper Kaza belly, Zhu Shuo's plan does not call for immediate attack on Cao Cao. Instead, Zhu Shou argues that their armies had just ended a rather long campaign against Gong Sun Zan and now needed rest. So instead of marching south, their best move would be to station a sizable force at the port city of Liyang to supervise the construction of more ships and siege weapons, while most of the army would be assigned to rebuilding the north and farming. At the same time, they can utilize their cavalry advantage, as Yuan Shao had great relationship with most of the northern nomadic tribes at this time, to send smaller detachments of raiding parties south to harass Cao Cao's weak points and force Cao Cao to exhaust his forces as they would have to be stretched thin to defend his sprawling borders. And within the next three years, victory would be a foregone conclusion, as Cao Cao's forces would be exhausted from dealing with these raids while Yuan Shao's forces would be stronger, better supplied, and more prepared for Cao Cao's defenses. However, other advisors like Shen Pei and Guo Tu firmly disagree with this plan and put it as too defensive and borderline cowardly. They argue that given their superiority in numbers, they should be confidently attacking, and delaying the final showdown to three years in the future might actually give Cao Cao the chance to turn things around when attacked today would certainly mean Cao Cao's doom. Now, of course, it is common for advisors to disagree on battle strategies, but to better understand why this disagreement within Yuan Shao's court occurred and why it will have an outsized impact on the future campaign, we must first understand the politics within Yuan Shao's court. As we mentioned earlier, Yuan Shao's chief military strategist at this time was Zhu Shou. And as I mentioned, Zhu Shou was a talented strategist who had already helped Yuan Shao secure the northern four provinces. However, politically, he did not agree entirely with many of Yuan Shao's policies. Namely, Yuan Shao's policy of assigning his sons to govern the different provinces. And when Yuan Shao first suggested his plan of having his sons and nephew govern the four provinces in order to assess their capabilities as a means to decide who the next heir will be, Zhu Shuo vehemently opposed this plan, arguing that this went against traditions and will be the start of the end for the Yuan clan. In fact, during the meeting to discuss this matter, Zhu Shuo would storm out in the middle of the meeting when he saw that Yuan Shao was insistent, and as he left the room, he muttered that this is where it all ends. Now, unlike Zhu Shuo, most of the other advisors did not try to stop Yuan Shao's plan for picking his heir as many understood that Yuan Shao only proposed this plan as a mean to give a chance to his favorite son, Yuan Shang, to become his heir. So very soon, two camps formed within Yuan Shao's court. First, there were those like Xinping and Guo Tu, 
who decided to ally with the eldest son, Yuan Tan, since tradition would dictate that the eldest son be made heir. And then there were those like Pang Ji and Shen Pei, who did not get along with Yuan Tan in the first place, and thus decided to side with Yuan Shang, since he was Yuan Shao's favorite son, and thus had a decent chance to become heir as well. And thus, a division was formed within Yuan Shao's own court. Now, however, on the matter of how to attack Cao Cao, both of these sides decided that they did not want Zhu Shuo's plan to work out because they didn't want Zhu Shuo to have command of most of the army. Now, the key here is that even though Zhu Shuo was against Yuan Shao's plan in regards to how to pick his heir, he decided not to actively side with either camps. He was not a traditionalist by any means. He simply thought the notion of pitting sons against sons would doom their cause. But for those other advisors who are now in the active battle to help their lord become the next heir, Zhu Shuo's control of the army was something that they all envied and wanted for themselves. In addition to that, if you think about it, had Yuan Shao used Zhu Shuo's plan here, and won the battle of Guandu, and eventually replaced Cao Cao as the regent of the Han, then there is no doubt that Zhu Shuo would have been rewarded handsomely and named to become the next grand commandant at the very least. And if these other advisors can convince Yuan Shao to use their plan, which they wholeheartedly believed would also result in a victory, as the disparity of manpower and supplies between Cao Cao and Yuan Shao at this point were quite astronomical, then perhaps they could secure a better future for themselves as well. So whether it was due to the eternal struggle for the next heir or the personal political games within Yuan Shao's own court, the opposition here was very strong against Zhu Shuo's plan. Now I have to note that there was one advisor that was in favor of Zhu Shuo's plan, and his name was Tian Feng, and we'll certainly come back to him in the future. But for the time being, with pretty much everyone opposing the plan, Yuan Shao decided to side with the masses as he turned down Zhu Shuo's more conservative plan for more aggressive action of concentrating their force at the capital of Xucheng in order to force Cao Cao's smaller army into a final showdown. And since Zhu Shuo's plan was rejected, it was also no longer appropriate for him to command the entire army as his command was split now into three, with him, Guo Tu, and Chun Yuqiong now sharing command of the army as they're now tasked with mustering and mobilization of the forces and the preparation of supplies necessary for the long campaign ahead. Meanwhile, while Yuan Shao's advisors debated the best course of action against Cao Cao, Cao Cao himself wasted no time to deploy his first line of defense. Now, I do have this very detailed map here, but there is just too much information on this map and everything is in Chinese. So aside from pointing out a few key locations just to get a sense of the geography, such as the city of Ye, where Yuan Shao's capital was located, and Xucheng, where Cao Cao held the imperial capital, we will only identify the location of Guandu on this map. Then for the rest of this episode, we will use a more simplified map here from an old newspaper clipping. But since the only image of this I can find is already annotated, I will actually just draw my own version here, using it to demonstrate key locations as we go forward to try to present a clearer picture. Now, using this map, we can locate Henei. And this is the piece of land that Cao Cao just gained control of after killing off Sui Gu and annexing Zhang Yang's old territory. And this is also the only piece of land that Cao Cao controlled north of the Yellow River. So it's quite crucial for him as he assigned Wei Zhong, to take over as the new administrator here in order to project a threat on the left flank of Yuan Shao's armies as a mean to not only protect the Yellow River crossings directly north of the Luoyang region, but also as a mean to distract Yuan Shao's forces from the Bin province. Now, speaking of Wei Zhong, he's actually quite an interesting character as he had originally joined Cao Cao quite early on and thus had immense trust from Cao Cao. And when Zhang Miao and Chen Gong betrayed Cao Cao in 194 and welcomed in Lü Bu while Cao Cao was away campaigning against Tao Tian. Cao Cao had proclaimed to his troops to not worry about the safeties of their families back at home, for Wei Zhong, who had been assigned to Chen Liu, would never betray him. But soon after, news arrived that Wei Zhong had actually abandoned his post and ran away as Lü Bu took control of most of Yan province, 
with the help of Zhang Miao and Cheng Gong. Disappointed, Cao Cao cursed Wei Zhong and declared that he better run as far south as the Yue lands or as far north as the nomadic steppes or else he will find him and punish him for his betrayal. And fate would have it that Wei Zhong would end up running to Henei to join Zhang Yang. And once Cao Cao had killed off Sui Gu and claimed Henei for himself, there was Wei Zhong among the captured officers. But thankfully, now five years removed from the incident, Cao Cao has calmed down as he decided to show mercy for old time's sake as he ordered for Wei Zhong's release and told him that he is still valued for his talents as he made him the new administrator here in Henei. But of course, as an added measure of security, on the south banks of the Yellow River, directly south of Henei, Cao Cao assigned Xia Hodun to secure these crossings to prevent attack from this flank. Then in the center of the conflict, Yu Jin was given 2,000 men to reinforce the administrator Dong Liu Yan to help secure the key crossings of Yanjing and Bai Ma, as these were the most likely points of attack, as the port city of Liang, opposite of Bai Ma, was the most suited location for a massive army crossing on the Yellow River. But Cao Cao had to defend other places too, as Cheng Yu was also given 700 men to guard the city of Zhen on the right flank, as Yuan Han had control of most of the Qing province directly east of Cao Cao's holdings, and apart from a few mountain ranges and shallow rivers, there wasn't really a big natural barrier like the Yellow River that could stop them. So playing defense on the eastern front was going to be very difficult. So instead, Cao Cao chose to go on the offensive, as he sent out Zhang Ba, who was the native in this area with popular support, to launch an offensive campaign against Yuan Tan in the areas around the princedom of Qi and Beihai. And this will effectively preoccupy Yuan Tan's forces in the Qing province and render them a non-factor in the Guandu campaign. Now, with his first line of defense in place, Cao Cao took the initiative as his armies, while much smaller in size, were also much easier to mobilize as he marched his main force north of the Yellow River to seize the poor city of Liang for himself in anticipation of Yuan Shao's arrival. And along the way, Cao Cao would identify the location of Guandu as an ideal defensive position and ordered Zhang Liao and Xu Huang to remain behind there with 10,000 men to start constructing defensive structures in preparation for the war ahead. And by August of 199, two months after Yuan Shao declared war, Cao Cao was ready, but Yuan Shao's massive army was not yet ready. And with the harvest season on the horizon, it was unlikely for Yuan Shao to actually mobilize in 199. But even without moving a single troop, Yuan Shao's declaration of war had its influence that started to present political and military challenges for Cao Cao. As by September, Liu Biao, the governor of the Jin province, rallied to Yuan Shao's war declaration. And despite his reluctance to commit his own troops to attack Cao Cao in the rear, he did start to incite administrators in the nearby Yu and Yan provinces to rebel against Cao Cao. And in particular in the Yu province, which is where Yuan Shao's hometown of Runan is located, all but one commandery joined Yuan Shao's cause, as only Li Tong of Yang'an decided to remain loyal to Cao Cao. Regional Yellow Turban remnants also jumped in at this opportunity to seek revenge against Cao Cao, as they too joined the war, led by the likes of Liu Pi and Gong Du. While the Western warlords did not rally to Yuan Shao's cause, they also promised to not support Cao Cao either, as they chose to remain neutral for the duration of the Guandu campaign. Zhang Xiu, who had fought, surrendered, then betrayed Cao Cao in 197, also thought about joining Yuan Shao's side, but for now, he remained undecided. To the south, Sun Ce also started to prepare his men for a northern campaign, as he too identified this war between Cao Cao and Yuan Shao as an opportunity for himself to try to strike Cao Cao from behind while he was busy dealing with Yuan Shao in the north. Lastly, the new governor of the Yu province, Liu Bei, who had joined Cao Cao during the campaign against Liu Bu, also received words from the general of the chariot, 
Dongcheng, who was also the father-in-law to the emperor, that the emperor had personally wrote a letter with his own blood, asking those who are still loyal to the Han to rally against Cao Cao in order to restore the Han. And since most of these loyalists were mere officials under Cao Cao's court in the capital and did not have any real troops under their command, their only means of support was through assassination plot that was put into motion in late 199 led by Dong Cheng, Liu Bei, Zhong Ji, Wu Shuo, Wu Zilan, and Wang Zifu. And the plan was to assassinate Cao Cao somewhere around January of 200. And in addition to this assassination plot, they also decided to pass along this blood edict of the emperor among the Han loyalists within the court to have all of them also sign this edict with their own blood in order to show their commitment for the cause. And with so many internal and external threats rising up against Cao Cao, the situation definitely looked bleak in late 199, as we will wrap up our episode here. When we come back next time, we'll see how many of these threats were neutralized as the first battle of this campaign will get underway in the Baimak Crossing. Hopefully y'all enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!